This is the Breaker.News podcast for the week of October 30th, 2022. I'm Bob Mackin, publisher of the Breaker.News and host of the Breaker.News podcast. Welcome to edition number 262 and happy Halloween. The Breaker is your source for news, opinion, and analysis about British Columbia issues, institutions, and influencers. Later, I'll tell you how you can support The Breaker. On this edition, headlines from the Pacific Rim and the Pacific Northwest. The Is It Just Me commentary. I award a virtual Nanaimo bar to a difference maker. And the Big Deal feature. Part 2 of my interview with Dan Russell, Canadian sports radio legend and author of Pleasant Good Evening, a memoir about 30 wild and tumultuous years hosting sports talk on the radio and online in British Columbia and beyond. Is it just me, or were there too many reasons to say yes to the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver, and too many reasons to say no to the 2030 Winter Olympics bid? The NDP government said no to the Canadian Olympic Committee and leaders of the Musqueam, Squamish, tsleil and Lilwat First Nations. I just think it's the wrong time. Uh, you know, government has a lot to focus on. It is an extraordinary expense uh, for the people of British Columbia. That is the voice of Lisa Baer, the BC Minister of Tourism, Arts, Culture and Sport, on October 27th after publicly announcing that the NDP government would not back the bid for the 2030 Winter Olympics. The Canadian Olympic Committee and four host First Nations were seeking more than $2.1 billion in cash and goods and services from federal, provincial and municipal taxpayers, plus a promise from the BC government to cover any deficits. But it was not to be. And government had to take a look at that bid and weigh it, uh, its costs, its risks, its potential benefits against government priorities like health care, like public safety, like, uh, um, you know, investing in the cost of living. You know, our canoe is stalled right now, you know, and it's, you know, truly, if we don't get the provincial federal government um, in the canoe, we are still here. We aren't going anywhere. That is the voice of Wilson Williams, council spokesperson for the Squamish Nation on October 28th, reacting to the decision. Leaders of the Squamish, Musqueam, tsleil and Lilwat nations collaborated with the Canadian Olympic Committee and made a last-ditch effort to change the government's mind. Canadian Olympic Committee President Tricia Smith. We were at the stage now where we said, okay, here's our best guess at where we are. Now we want to get the, the province and the federal government in the room, along with the partners here that have been meeting, to say what could work, what, what doesn't work for you, what, what can work. But we haven't had the chance to have that conversation yet. I think there, there has to be some clarification around the numbers. You have to look at the numbers, you have to look at also the benefits. No support from the governments uh, would, would kill the bid, but we're saying that we're still here to have that conversation. We want meaningful dialogue. If we want true reconciliation, we need to be in the room talking amongst and with you at equal and as an equal voice. There would be no other, no future opportunity for Winter Games till 2034. And we imagine there would be a lot more people in the, um, in the competition in 2034. I think we've already heard of a few of them. 2030, um, I think we have a very good chance, um, an excellent chance of being awarded these games. Just a few hours later, though, Lisa Bear's office reiterated the B.C. government decision there will be no games in B.C. in 2030 without B.C. government support. Outgoing Vancouver City Councillor Colleen Hardwick finished third on October 15th in the Vancouver Civic election. She had promised to hold a plebiscite on the bid to give citizens a chance to decide on the bid like they did in 2003. Hardwick said it would have been irresponsible to proceed with this bid, while the board minutes and financial reports from the 2010 Winter Olympics remain locked up at the city archives until fall 2025. I actually um, acknowledge the provincial government on this because they did go through a balanced exercise of looking at the pros and cons. Didn't didn't respond just to the boosterism or to the fact that it was a First Nations bid, but rather what its its impact would be overall and the risks that would be taken and looking at the larger economy. So um, that was a 
a responsible thing for the provincial government to do. And when the city did it, the, through staff, the electeds overruled it. And so um, this shows to me that, that the provincial government has taken a much more mature and balanced approach to assessing uh, the opportunity. What do you think? Did the NDP government make the right decision or the wrong decision? Does Vancouver need another Winter Olympics? Let me know. Email bob at thebreaker.news. This is the Big Deal feature on the Breaker.News podcast. Sports Talk Orchestra, part two of my interview with Dan Russell, the author of Pleasant Good Evening, a memoir, my 30 wild and turbulent years of sports talk. Who was the ultimate guest, the, the, your favorite guest throughout the 30 years, and who was the guest that uh, you're glad you only had on once? Brian Burke was on every week. He was smart. He was outspoken, uh, quick, funny, passionate, loyal. I mean, he checked all those boxes and I go through the whole, you know, Burke and I had quite a history and that's all in the book, the good and the not so good. So it was, it was a brilliant thing for the show uh, that, that Burke was on at that time. I mean, it just never happened then, Bob, you never had a, a high management figure coming on every week. And that's where really appointment radio began those Wednesday night sessions. Uh, with with Brian Burke, um, and we can go on and on about that. Who who did I have on that I probably w- one that jumps out? I'm sure there was many. I mean, I, I interviewed twenty five thousand people, you know, at least. And one that jumps out to me is former BC Lions great quarterback, but he was in management by this time. Was Joe Cap, and I just felt that night he was whether he was always like that or not, but he was being a bit of a horse's rear end. And it was just, it wasn't, you know, I was so used to at that point having a rhythm built with a guest and there was no rhythm. And I, I can't, I can't remember all the instances why I just remember when it was over, I said, I, just thought, I don't want to interview this guy anymore. His, his time on sports talk, uh, Brian Burke, uh, that helped him develop his uh, media profile and of course uh, helped further his career. And, well, Joe Cap, uh, any, anybody who uh, was aware of or was at Grey Cup in 2011 and saw his uh, scuffle with Angelo Mosca uh, knows that Joe Cap was uh, was kind of a one in one in the million kind of guy, a great quarterback in his time, but uh, uh, someone who who really marched to the beat of his own drummer uh, as both a quarterback and uh, a coach. Um, now, you you also mentioned in the book, of course, the chapter on carrying the Olympic torch, uh, being part of uh, the Olympics. Uh, one of 12,000 people. I was one of the 12,000 people, too. I was part of the the uh, procession across Canada. I did mine uh, in Edmonton uh, in January of 2010. Uh, you were closer to the actual opening of the Games where you had your chance to uh, carry the Olympic torch with the Olympic flame. And uh, you were in the same group as Steve Nash, uh, who, of course, yes. had uh, even bigger uh, duties with the Olympic torch, with the Olympic flame just a few days later. Uh, walk us back through uh, that experience of being uh, part of the Olympic torch relay. One of the greatest uh, experiences of my life, to be honest. I mean, uh, I, I still feel it. I still, uh, when you bring it up, I almost get goosebumps again, just think, thinking about what that was. And I mean, nobody knows that whole uh, 2010 year and prior and after like you do. So you, you understand in a way that other people may not the whole legacy of the games good and bad but uh i had it uh my day that was the day before the actual opening ceremony so you're right it was it was exciting as as all could be um i i had resolved to do a hockey game i was broadcasting in the western hockey league all those years 
doing the WHL on shop. That was in Medicine Hat. And normally I wouldn't answer the phone. I don't know why I did. It was like five minutes to the drop of the puck. And I could barely hear it. I still don't know who it was on the other end of the line. And they asked if I could carry it. Now, I couldn't concentrate on that game the rest of the night. And uh, when, when it was, I flew back. And when it was my, I remember the morning I uh, was doing it, I, I, I took a tennis racket in front of my house. They told me how long I was going to have to go for it. So I'm carrying the tennis racket and looking like a real geek just to make sure that I could do that little distance um, and get a little warm up. And uh, yeah, so ended up at, uh, I think it was the Kitsilano Community Center. Uh, they, they give you a briefing, they give you a uniform, they give you a torch, and they put you on this bus. And it, it the excitement just builds and builds. Uh, um, because being the day before the Olympics, every time we stopped, the door would open of the bus. Somebody, a new there was like 25 or 30 of us on the bus when we started and the door would open and it'd be so loud. And then the door would close. We go to the next stop. And when Steve Nash came out, it was like, Holy smokes. And anyway, mine was uh, in uh, Carisdale on West Boulevard around 47, which was really kind of special for me because my parents grew up like, I don't know, a hundred meters from where I was carrying this torch. They'd met right on the, on the same street that because my uh, grandfather owned a pool hall that's where they met uh in the 50s and i i went right by that location carrying that torch and and uh, uh you know i i just it went by it was a blur but it was like the the adrenaline was amazing yeah when i when i ran i, I practiced by running across the canby bridge because they told me about 350 meters or so and they said uh yeah, yeah. I practice as if you're uh, carrying a, a liter bottle of water. So I, I was maybe the only person uh, in history of the Canby Street Bridge <laughs> to be running with a, a liter of, of water. Uh, and when it happened in Edmonton, uh, it, it uh, went. You know, the the bus ride was great before and after. And but but you actually, when you get out of the bus, you stand there, and uh, you know the you actually get your your flame lit, and it went by with like a blur i think i ran uh, faster than i ran before uh i got back on and uh, uh my, my girlfriend was there on the sidewalk and she couldn't keep up with me and i actually uh, burned a bit of my uh, my glove the dimples on the special edition uh red mittens uh got a little bit of a burn there just because i was so excited but i didn't feel the didn't feel the burn uh, it was uh it was quite the time but uh, luckily it was uh for posterity's sake on both video and, and photos now the uh, the olympics were a great time because they ended with uh, a hockey championship the gold medal game in vancouver and vancouver ice the biggest hockey game in vancouver uh really since the vancouver millionaires won the stanley cup way back when and uh you know long before our time and uh, we still haven't seen it in our time that that would probably be the the biggest regret of your sports talk career, as you mentioned in the book, in A Pleasant Good Evening, that you never got a chance uh, during all those years of doing sports talk to say that uh, the Vancouver Canucks are Stanley Cup champions. Um, do you think it'll it'll happen anytime soon? Where, where, where do you think this franchise is going? Well, it is a regret. I mean, to, to do the show so many years and never, you know, I, so many nights I remember, you know, it might be a, a night in, January or middle of March, uh, you know, welcome back to sports talk coming to you on a night when the Canucks beat the Chicago Blackhawks three to one or, you know, whatever it was, you know, on a night when, on a night when I used to always say that, but I never got to say, welcome back to sports talk on a night when the Vancouver Canucks won the Stanley cup. I mean, that just would have been even just saying it right now. It just, it seems so surreal. Um, you know, the first time they went was, was, uh, you know, kind of a, I mean, they were a great team in terms of their character and stuff, but you know that was '82, and you know they were they were not a, a, a wonderful team. The '94 group was a great team, and the old the 2011 team was really strong. Um, and now there's 32 te teams. So every time they add one, Vegas not too many years ago, Seattle last year, you know every time they add one, it gets harder and harder. I mean, the odds are are uh, pretty pretty difficult. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I guess it could happen in any year, in a given year. Uh, I don't think we're there yet, but let's say 
let's say this team does kind of build through this current core with the goalie and the, the, the you know the strike down the middle and you know one good defenseman right now maybe they build on that maybe in sports right but logically speaking it doesn't seem like they're that close to me i mean i i'm not i'm not doing this day to day anymore so i can't speak with the kind of so-called expertise that i used to have but it doesn't feel like they're super close in a 32 team league to win four rounds of playoffs let alone, i mean it's hard to get in the playoffs and you know so that that is and and how many years have they not been in the playoffs of, of late that's it's kind of remarkable so i i don't know bob i mean no nobody knows i mean i used to say you know will it ever happen in my lifetime and i, I think it's a question for everybody at this point it's, it's uh, at least 50 years or older i don't know i have no idea well, well, we've also uh, or coming down to uh, to uh, the the time deadline. We uh, we won't have any circus time, but we've got a couple more minutes left uh, for people to uh, hear more from Dan Russell and also pick up a pleasant good evening. Uh, the the great book about uh, his uh, all his years on sports talk in the Vancouver area, and of course, you're joining us from uh, Wahin, Thailand. Uh, it all came to a close May. 2014 on Sea Isle in Richmond, uh, where you started, and what's next for for Dan Russell? Well, I mean, first of all, the book was really rewarding. I I, I couldn't believe how how rewarding it was. It was a labor, a labor of love, but it was a labor. It did force me for the first time to really reflect and appreciate the show. You know, Bob, you know they just keep coming these shows. You're doing one after the other after the other this show ends you know, about the one that that is up next so i never really reflected on the show until i wrote this book um you know i i'm open to things actually right now i think this is what i needed was a time out uh i am in my very, very early 60s so i think that i still have a contribution to make unfortunately the media landscape is you know as as you know is just it's really a difficult um landscape for anybody to to a chance to do anything i would like an opportunity to do something it came and that might be in the form of a podcast i've had people ask me about that and i i've archived so much of our show and i think there might be a podcast idea where i uh do kind of a, a then and now uh if you will where i would take snippets of old interviews i wouldn't play them all in their entirety i would just take you know some two or three minutes here two or three minutes there and remark about what that person was like and what that time was like, and then maybe bring it to today. I, that's that's an idea I'm floating around. Um, but at this moment, um, I, I really don't have anything in the hopper. Well, thanks again to Dan Russell, author of A Pleasant Good Evening. It's all about uh, his years hosting Sports Talk in Vancouver. Dan, where can people get a copy of the book? The best place is Amazon, amazon.ca, and they deliver it usually within two days. Um, and the website that I have is called danrussellsportstalk.com, danrussellsportstalk, all one word, dot com. And you'll, you'll see not only a lot on the book and how you get it and stuff, but I've got, I've got a lot of audio on there as well. Some turn back the tape, some memoir moments, uh, as I call them, um, it, just moments of, of things that happened on the show. So I, the website is kind of fun to keep adding to it. There's a blog on there and such. Uh, so Dan Russell sports talk.com. The book is available on Amazon and it's just so nice that you would invite me on to reminisce, Bob. It's, it really is. That time went by fast. Time flies when you're having fun. And uh, when I was a guest on sports talk, the same thing happened. Uh, time, time flew, but we, we, we packed so much in there. And it was always fun to be on Sports Talk, always fun to listen to Sports Talk, and great fun to talk to you again, and great fun to read all those great stories in the book. So thanks again to Dan Russell for joining me on the Breaker.News podcast. Thanks for having me on, Bob. A Pleasant Good Evening is available now in hardcover, paperback, and ebook. Go to danrussellsportstalk.com to buy your copy. Okay.
podcast for Around the Rim. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Rim. In the Taiwan news, activist says Taiwan should join world, demand Hong Kong media moguls freedom. Journalist and human rights activist Yang Sen Hong says such a move would show Taiwan's will to advance democracy. A Hong Kong court found media mogul Jimmy Lai guilty of fraud. Yang wrote that Taiwan opposition parties should take this, quote, critical moment to declare their stance on the subject. Quote, rescuing Jimmy Lai should be the fundamental morality in Taiwan's political world, he wrote. In Mainichi News, syphilis cases in Japan soar above 10,000 in 2022 for first time. Last year, Japan saw more than 7,800 cases, a record at the time, but that figure was passed in September of this year. Sex with multiple partners, met through social media and dating apps, has been blamed as a factor behind the surge. Syphilis cases began to increase in Japan around 2011. The number declined in 2020, but jumped again last year. In Hong Kong Free Press, Ex-editor who quit after Xinjiang story axed dismisses South China Morning Post letter warning of further action if he publishes it. The South China Morning Post has sent a warning to a former editor who resigned along with two reporters after their three-part series on rights abuses in Xinjiang was axed by management last year. The SMP told Hong Kong Free Press that the series had failed to meet its editorial verification process and publishing standards despite it relying on a review of official government data. Peter Langan said it would have been, quote, unethical to conceal the killing of a valid piece of journalism on what was happening in Xinjiang to the Uyghur people. That's Around the Rim on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. Now it's time on the Breaker.News podcast for Cascadia Calling. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Northwest. In the Salem Statesman Journal, 2022 Oregon November general election, what's on your ballot? Oregonians in November will select a new governor, several new members of Congress, and a slate of state lawmakers. They'll be asked to weigh in on ballot measures about guns and legislative walkouts. Many also will have county and local candidates and ballot measures to consider. Voters can also decide on health care funding and banning slavery. It's about time to ban slavery, even though it has been illegal federally for 150 years. In King 5, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State visits Seattle to discuss technology and how it relates to foreign policy. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman was at the University of Washington when it was announced that next year Seattle will be the host city for the APEC Forum. Seattle will be the prime venue for a summit that promotes sustainable economic growth, trade, and investment. Blake Island, near Seattle, hosted the 1993 summit. In 1997, APEC came to the University of British Columbia, where protesters were arrested en masse. APEC members include Russia, China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, as well as Canada, U.S., Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, and other countries around the Pacific Rim. In the Times Colonist, a close encounter with a rare fish in Alert Bay. Whale scientist Jared Towers was surprised when a giant tropical fish showed up just a few meters from his waterfront home. The massive Mola sunfish, two meters wide and three meters across and a third of a meter thick, was basking and swimming in the calm bay. Also known as the ocean sunfish, it is the heaviest known bony fish in the world and normally lives in around New Zealand and Australia and across to Chile and South Africa. That's Cascadia Calling on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. The virtual Nanaimo Bar, brought to you by Spruce Hill Contracting. Every week we end the Breaker.News podcast on a tasty note by awarding the goodness of a virtual Nanaimo bar to people making a difference. A virtual version of the province's favorite dessert bar goes this week to the scientists, the nurses, the pharmacies, the delivery couriers, everyone involved in getting you the COVID-19 or flu shots this fall. It's Immunization Action Week in British Columbia. Get your shots and stay healthy. You can nominate someone for a virtual Dynamo bar. Send me an email to bob at thebreaker.news. 
Spruce Hill Contracting, Custom Homes and Renovations. Find more information at sprucehill.ca. That's it for the Breaker.News podcast for the week of October 30th, 2022. I'm Bob Mackin. Thanks for joining me. Did you know that on the 30th of October in 1945, Negro League star Jackie Robinson of the Kansas City Monarchs signs with the National League's Brooklyn Dodgers? Now you know. Send me your feedback. Send me your story ideas to Bob at TheBreaker.News. Bookmark TheBreaker.News. You can also find us at TheBreaker.ca. Sign up for the email newsletter and get updates to your inbox. For news as it happens, follow The Breaker News on Twitter and visit TheBreaker.News on Facebook. You can support The Breaker for as little as $2 a month. For more information, go to Patreon.com slash TheBreakerNews. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash TheBreakerNews. Happy Halloween and happy Guy Fox Day. Until next week. 